Follow the microphone. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight for the uh, last lecture in our season. So it's, uh, I don't know all of you. So, so my name is Paul Linzer. I am one of the senior faculty here at the Whitney Lab. Uh, I've been here 35 years, and I am assuming the responsibility of hosting these into the future. So you'll get used to my, if nothing else, you'll get used to my mustache. Uh, anyway, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker tonight. I do want to let you know that there probably will be one in September, will be the next one. So just as you know, check whitney.ufl.edu on a regular basis. And once we book the, the next season schedule, it'll go up right away. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Newsom, who is going to talk about elephants, of all things. You know, and, and, and I showed her my elephant bone. I have an elephant bone, and, and, she, and I think she thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. And so she comes to us. She's currently a faculty at Flagler College, but she moved down here from Penn State, where she was there for 15... <laughs> Snow! <laughs> anyway, but she moved down here from Penn State. She is actually a graduate of the University of Florida, though. She got her degrees from UF. <laughs> chomp, chomp, go Gators. And she's uh, in sort of in the, in the midst. She's emeritus at Penn State. She's emeritus here. She's doing some of the interesting things she'll tell you about tonight, but a lot of other things that have to do with plants and how plants uh, can, and plant fossils can give you the history of the universe as we know it. So, <laughs> there you go. So I, I'm not going to waste my time trying to read all of this because I can barely see it, but I'm going to step out of the way and, and let Lee take the show. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can you hear me? This? All right. Excellent. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. Thanks so much. I've been interested in Whitney Labs for a long time, but not known much about it. So it was very nice to get a good tour from Paul and get to learn more. And uh, I did kind of strong arm Flagler into a position. I'm really glad to be back in the South and back in my home, actually. And the, most of my research is in Florida and the Caribbean, so, so that's good, too. Um, but for many years, it has involved uh, ancient elephants uh, in the Panhandle region for the most part, but pretty much throughout, and you'll see why. Um, so I'm going to focus on mammoths and mastodons in their last presence and delve a little bit into ideas about extinction overall for those megafauna and, and other extinct animals at the end of the Ice Age, the Pleistocene epic, um, and and use two projects that I've been working on as a case study to illustrate some of this um, and, and maybe get you talked into participating with us in, uh, in some of this work. So, um, so these are the two proboscideans, the two elephant genera of interest. Um, the mammoth, Mammuthus, had four species in North America at, towards the close of the Pleistocene and through much of the Pleistocene. And it was a grazer, the dentition, this is just a single molar that you're seeing here, um, reflects that. It, it, it grazed on grasses and sedges, soft herbaceous vegetation, and, and these uh, molars served to grind that material up, including plant crystals embedded in the leaves and so on. The browse, I mean, the um, mastodon one species was present from the Miocene through the Pleistocene epochs in North America, and it was a browser, so different niche, some niche partition. And the, again, the dentition with these very elevated um, ridges on the molars was evolved and all about browsing uh, woody vegetation. So it's like your deer equivalent of the Pleistocene. So those are the two main animal taxa and the subject of, of everything that I'm covering. Well, the one project, the one case study, involves the Gulf Coastal region of Florida. So you may be aware that the Ocilla, Wasissa, and um, 
Wakulla rivers and their drainages actually out into the Gulf of Mexico um, have abundance of fossil elephant and other fossil remains and later in time too evidence of the first Floridians, the first Indians to colonize the state. So, um, so I'm going to delve a little bit into that project but focusing on the mastodons, the original forest elephant as it was called in that case. And then the other project is way across, well north, in the Aleutian and Privilof Islands, specifically the Privilofs here, so way north into the far corner of North America. And this involves woolly mammoths and the last presence of woolly mammoths. So uh, more elephants, but a completely different terrain. And this one's been really fun and interesting, and we just uh, concluded one portion of the project and are continuing to work on it. So I'm uh, overviewing one portion that we published just uh, this past August and with uh, Russ Graham, a uh, vertebrate paleontologist at the Earth and Mineral Science Museum at Penn State as the lead. Um, so I'm going to overview and try to do, uh, do best by everybody that is part of the team you know, all research anymore is very transdisciplinary and multiple peoples involved. And our, our project received a lot of news and for the uh, November uh, Discover magazine, it was actually the cover story. So some of what I'm drawing on and some of the images come from that too, highlighting the work. And uh, also it was featured in the New York Times just in March this year along with some related evidence. So I'm going to touch upon that too. Okay, so um, before getting into those two basic projects, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Ice Age fauna. Um, not sure if you're very familiar with it, but many of you may well be. Um, completely different assemblages of, of animal taxa in North America, and in, including Florida, and it makes it all the more interesting. So um, musk ox, you probably are familiar with that, is one that survived and, and lives today, is, a, is extant. But the woodland musk ox, musk ox and the shrub musk ox both became extinct. I've, I've highlighted this one a little bit larger because it was the one that ranged into Central America and Florida. So it's kind of your southern version. And we also had camels and yamas and peccaries here in Florida and variously in North America. These taller forms are extinct now, and that was a browser, and that was a grazer, and you probably know the extant um, peccaries today, so more herbivores, in addition to the uh, e elephants that I just mentioned. Um, bears, right, uh, omnivores and carnivores, so the dire wolf and the spectacle bear st still survives in South America. This is one of my favorites, the short-faced bear, and you get a sense of the size. So another part of this uh, Pleistocene fauna, and cats, big cats that used to be present, scimitar cat, Jaguar is one that survived, as we all know. Smilodon is famous for these amazing fangs. And here's the American lion, which again, all these were present in Florida. This one's genetically been tied to being essentially identical to African lions just recently. And oddballs, too. So you may be aware of the giant sloths, ground-dwelling sloths, with the one exception of this miniaturized version that lived on Cuba up until about 6,000 years ago. It was also a giant armadillo, bigger than the modern armadillo, one called the beautiful armadillo. That's my favorite, <laughs> Holmesima. And um, the glyptodont, which recently, if I'm not mistaken, the genetic latest evidence for that ties it to armadillos, and it, it looks very armadillo-like, but went extinct. And we could go over many more, but just, you know, that gives a basic sense. 
So this American late ice age, late Pleistocene fauna was really diverse across many um, mammalian classes and um, you know, lots of varieties, species and so on within each class. And this is just kind of a classic painting depicting the um, Beringian, the ice age landscape, tundra-like landscape in the northern reaches but south of the ice. And then this is the same image showing the extinctions at the end of the Ice Age. And it's pretty shocking, isn't it? When you look at how much was lost, 74% or 45 out of 61 genera of mammals for, um, for North America, it's, it's more, greater losses for South America and variously around the world we could cite similar figures. So, of course, this has drawn a lot of attention as to the causes for extinction, and, and that is part of this whole story that I'm involved with. So, um, there have been all kinds of ideas floated, and I'm just overviewing some of the main ideas that have been discussed and with proponents on either side over the years. Um, as far as direct causation and human hunting is, has been a favorite of many and was first promoted by Paul Martin in 1967 and just called for short overkill. And he came up with this Blitzkrieg version a few years later. And it's all about humans entering the North American continent and one way or the other overhunting <laughs> and eliminating uh, the megafauna, the Ice Age fauna. The Blitzkrieg is, is the same thing, just faster. And I'll come back to that. Um, another idea is hyperdisease, promoted um, originally by Ross McPhee of the American Museum of Natural History. This idea uh, centers on migrating Paleo-Indians entering North America from Northeast Asia, along with dogs. Dogs had been domesticated much earlier, it appears, um, in one to two places, and were uh, accompanying humans across in their voyage of the migrations into the Americas. And it's thought that uh, diseases like parvovirus um, were able to jump across species, and the North American fauna would have been um, vulnerable, like Native Americans when Europeans arrived in smallpox and some of these illnesses. And so that, that this was devastating for Native American mammals and caused a lot of extinctions. This one is sort of still out there. It's really hard to prove. Um, so far, um, there just hasn't been good evidence to really support it, though they continue to work on it. Habitat destruction, originally, the original idea had to do with humans entering the continent and burning, causing a lot of burning, whether for hunting or by accident or, or for other reasons, and um, thereby sort of indirectly causing the extinction of megafauna. Um, it's been a little more nuanced in recent years, and, and I cite an article here. And Trophic Cascades is um, one of my favorites, considering one way or the other the loss of keystone species. So just as African elephants today are keystone species, we assume these ancient proboscideans were too, whether in the forest habitats or on the plains. And so you eliminate those, and then you know a whole suite of organisms can cascade into extinction along with them. And in recent years, too, these two have been greatly nuanced by people in incorporating more ecological ideas and population biology, thinking about the sizes of the animals, um, of individual populations, and isolation effects and things like that. So, so it, it's, it's interesting, and, it, and it, it's ongoing. Another suite of, of new ideas is catastrophes happening. Um, some have talked about a mega drought. I don't know that, that that's held up uh, much anymore. The extraterrestrial impact, this is an image from Discover that was trying to portray the KT boundary, the impact that has been implicated to eliminate much of the dinosaurs, right? That extinction much longer way back, but um, these scholars have promoted another, a similar impact theory, maybe not as devastating, 
are um, late in the Ice Age, around 11, 12,000 years ago, during this Younger Dryas period. I'll come back to that. It's been widely disputed. Their evidence for nanodiamonds has been disputed um, by some, but, but they continue to work on it. And just recently, a set of scholars, including someone working in Florida, um, has detected what they say is a platinum anomaly and maybe connected with something like this. So, so that's another idea out there for possible causation. This is, this is from Russ, the lead paleontologist. He's responsible for those colors. <laughs> so I apologize, it's bright. Um, obviously, to try to understand all this and link causation you know, with the e extinctions or extirpation of these different animal types, you have to know something about when they died. So, so Russ Graham and colleagues a whole host of vertebrate paleontologists have been gathering fossil bone from good sites, you know, good fossil contexts, and dating the bone, and with increasingly refined methods to date the bone. So this plot is simply showing you, this histogram, the number of dated specimens of uh, mammoth here, mammuthus, um, mammut, the um, mastodon, and moving through things like horse and the camels and different taxa, right? The numbers dated to start trying to get a sense of did they all just die 10,000 years ago? Or um, is there a spread? And, and the long story short, this is one of two graphs that I'll show you, is, you know, you're definitely seeing some extinctions in, occurring fairly early on. Here's before the 40,000 year mark. And uh, on forward, quite a few though, you know, shortly before about 10,000 years ago. So it's kind of a mixed bag, um, but it's really important to look at this if you're going to implicate humans as maybe wiping out all the megafauna it was thought around 10,000 years ago. So in, in other words, it's a little more complex than originally thought. Here's horse, disappeared long ago. And of course, horse was reintroduced by um, Spanish conquistadors. Here's the camels and one of those uh, musk ox. In addition, then, you have to get a fix on the timing of humans, human entry into the Americas, and there's been a lot of new work on that, a lot of redating and uh, careful re returning to sites to inspect the evidence. So, um, with the, the last uh, Pleistocene epoch, the Ice Age epoch, you're probably aware that this great continental set of ice sheets tied up a lot of water, right? So sea levels was, were much lower. And so you had the creation of this Beringian land bridge, as it's often termed, and people and animals could walk across. And a much wider Florida, the Florida platform was exposed at the height of the last glaciation. It's about 20, 21,000 years ago. All right, and so the, originally the idea was that people had to wait until ice-free corridors opened up as the glacial ice is retreating and conditions are coming towards a more modern type. And, uh, and, and one idea had people racing through here and blitzkrieging all the animals. That's where the blitzkrieg idea comes through. There have been problems with that about the rate of getting through this corridor and how do you survive when you're passing through, like all of Canada, right? Um, and, and newer ideas, too, uh, posit people coming along the shore in boats and maybe not having to wait till 11,000 or so years ago. Um, when the ice-free corridor would open, and, and there's more than one time for that. So, so the human entry picture is being much clarified in recent years. And this is by way of example, this Clovis was thought to be the, the first Paleo-Indians to enter North America. Um, Clovis first is the model that hypothesized that they came and, and decimated the megafauna. They have these diagnostic spear points, lithic, so that's a stone point, and were described as big game hunters for years. 
One thing that has been done with all the redating is to clarify the Clovis window, and it turns out to be much shorter than originally proposed. So the Clovis was a much longer period of time, and it was easier to attribute megafaunal extinctions to them. But with this tighter window and seeing extinctions well before Clovis and some surpassing the Clovis time, it puts the pressure off of, of Paleo-Indians. There is now mounting evidence, though, for pre-Clovis peopling of the North Americas, so that is something that we're all taking into consideration. The one thing about that is there's, um, the evidence is much less. It looks like there were far fewer peoples in, the, in North America and South America and so on earlier than Clovis. People were present, it seems quite clear, but not in great densities. What I'm trying to say is not enough to start thinking about them just wiping out the animals in one fell swoop. Okay, and then also the orange bar there, um, that's pointing to this Younger Dryas episode. So this was a late Pleistocene episode that occurred, climatic episode. So conditions had started to turn warmer, glacial ice is receding, and then this is a sudden return to super cool conditions, almost to ice age, almost to peak ice age conditions. So it's, it's part of climate models that implicate climate and climate change is the main factor underlying the extinction of, of the elephants and, and other megafauna. And when you track this, which has done a lot of redating, you can see that it brackets the extinction of the uh, mastodon and mammoths. So there's some plausibility in some uh, schools of thought for climate being a, a huge factor. And of course, like I said a minute ago with more nuanced thinking, things that go along with this are, you know, vegetation shifts and habitat change, and so food resources for animals and uh, something I will also come back to. And also regarding climate, if you know much about the whole track, the whole record through the Pleistocene, and that's what you're seeing here, um, beginning of Pliocene, the whole Pleistocene into modern times, Holocene, there's this zigzag pattern, right? You're seeing um, the differential retreat and advance of glaciers. So in the different two colors, the interglacial cycles, the retreat are in pink, and then the advances are in blue, back and forth, back and forth, through all that time, with some change in amplitude here in the more recent uh, millennia. This, you may be aware, is very much tied to the orbital cycle of the planet and the complexities of the orbital cycle, as it's increasingly understood. And what um, Russ Graham has been doing is revisiting climate as a causal factor for extinctions, and specifically what he's been calling his threshold model. So the, the main argument previously against climate change was that there'd been all this going on in the past and these animals survived it. So how can we just say this terminal Pleistocene time frame is what caused the extinction if it's only about climate. But he's been looking at these last uh, episodes here, and uh, as I mentioned, some differences in amplitude, and he's kind of modeling um, vulnerability. So go from a healthy species through one episode, and they're reduced in numbers, maybe populations a little bit isolated, and you're vulnerable going into the second one, and you're more threatened going into the third one, and you're in danger at this stage, and maybe much reduced populations to finally the, something like the younger Dryas being sort of the fell swoop, and you have extinction. So th that, that idea is also <laughs> floating around now a more nuanced, nuanced view. So the sum total of all that is that there is still a lot of thinking about uh, Ice Age extinctions. The debate goes on. Um, what causal factors were most, you know, most important were humans, you know, and they're hunting a factor, and it, they must certainly have been on some level, and sa same with climate and the intermixing of all of it. 
So it, it goes on, including also more fossil evidence and more dating of fossils and likewise human sites. And so you're seeing the last ages again in, in the Discover article for individual taxa. And you probably can't tell, but the elephants are up here. And this is woolly mammoth. And you're seeing it's ending here around 12,000 years ago. I think that's got it. But if you keep tracking, then there's, whoop, what's that? And there's another blip right there, right? So this is St. Paul Island, one of the islands we've been working on, and it's a, a tooth, a woolly mammoth tooth that our team recovered from a cave on the island and dated at around 6,200 years old, or maybe it was 6'3". And then here's even later evidence for woolly mammoths. So that drew our attention, you know, to, to look at the causes of extinction. And in particular, St. Paul Island wasn't inhabited by humans until about 200 years ago when Russians moved Aleutian Aleut peoples from the Aleutian Islands out there. So we kind of eliminate that human part for causal factors. And just a chance to apply new evidence. And so here's the second of these uh, dating diagrams. And, you know, big clustering of fauna at this around 10,000 year mark. You're seeing some of the cats up here. Here's Paleolama. Um, some of the giant ground sloths. Here's mammoths at large. Here's our, our um, woolly mammoth, Mammuthus primogenus, and this variety, Rangulensis, is out here at 5,000. So this is part of this evidence drawing our attention. Here's horse, here's giant tortoise, like from Florida. Here's the mastodon. So, um, so I'm headed into that first example and, and uh, describing this research. So this is a, an image and a quote from that Discover article summarizing an iconic example of the Ice Age megafauna of North America. The mammoth went extinct soon after humans arrived, whether or not humans are the main issue, except for isolated populations. And so the Privilof Islands represents one of these isolated populations. And, and so our team went there in the hopes of understanding a little bit more about this overall situation. And in fact, the Privilofs down here aren't the only such record. There's another very late record for, um, for woolly mammoth up here at Wrangell Island, and that variety was named after that. So, so these two, and there's some tentative evidence too for a few other isolates out in this region, so isolates of this ancient fauna surviving on these island remnants of that ancient land bridge, that ancient Beringia, which is here, right? So it, it's thought that for millennia, humans, the animals were moving back and forth across that land bridge as long as it was exposed. And, um, and as sea levels rose with the, the uh, retreat of the glaciers, waters released, a whole bunch of things going on, um, there are ultimately islands left behind and with their resident populations, any animals that stayed on board. So here is, um, is the location again off of the Aleutian Islands up here. And here is St. Paul Island, which is our, our main study site as one of the key islands in the Privilofs group. The tooth that I mentioned, which was found in 2003, is from a cave right here. And this lake hill is a remnant volcanic cone that is filled with water. This lake hill's apparently been present for quite a long time. And um, several years ago, a palynologist placed a sediment core in that lake, hoping to have a Pleistocene and the Holocene record of Beringian forests or tundra, whatever would be present, document that environment. And so we knew it was a good location, and, and we went back and record there to do more high-resolution work and with the whole battery of people working on it try to understand this evidence. 
So I already mentioned that people have not been present on the island until quite recently, and, and we've been working with the Aleut. Um, that's a, an environmental camp for kids. And they have been finding uh, mammoth and all kinds of walrus and other extinct faunal remains eroding out of the beaches on the island, but also in, in these solution caves variously. So one thing that we were doing was meeting with the Aleut community and, uh, and sampling, this is a mammoth tooth, um, sampling the material and dating it and just basically collecting more evidence. So um, 65,000 years ago. In addition, an archaeologist had um, visited the island and gotten some of the mammoth bone and dated it to 79,000. So both of these dates are, are quite a bit more recent than the bulk of the extinction events on the mainland, right, for mammoths. Woolly mammoth, all of, they're all gone by about 10,000 years ago. So the team also did some redating with more refined methods of some of these items, the first tooth being redated, another tooth that the Aleut had redated, um, the bone here redated, and here's Wrangell Island dates at 43, so it, it's even younger. Imagine this on, on Wrangell and perhaps up here, Woolly mammoths are doing their thing, you know, living and, and living as they always have. And Egyptian pyramids are being constructed. I mean, it's kind of a, a strange way to think about things when we've all thought these animals were long extinct before anything like Egyptian or, or other civilization. All right, so with, with St. Paul in particular and looking like it had a good record, we wanted to go back and, and also look for any more recent records. You know, how long did the woolly mammoth survive on the island? And why did they ultimately become extinct? So um, one thing that we did was some sea level modeling to determine when um, St. Paul became an island as opposed to a portion of Beringia, of the land bridge. And, um, and that's what you're seeing here. At, at 14,700 years ago, it was still part of the ancient Beringia. And likewise, St. George's Island is another of the Privilofs. But by 135, it became an island. And thereafter, with progressive sea level rise, it's smaller and smaller until the present island, which is um, 40 square acres fairly small. So we're, of course, interested in how the reduced island size over time would bear on survivability of a mammoth population, among others, food resources and, and so on. So this is the volcanic lake hill that um, the paleontologist cored years ago. It's, it's, again, a volcanic crater, and we went back and record it. And we went back during the winter, which is interesting, out on the Bering Sea. Um, and the reason was we wanted a real stable coring platform, get really good cores. And so we wanted the lake frozen over and literally to drill through the, the lake ice and then down into the sediments and retrieve these sediment cores. That's, that's part of the team <laughs> getting dirty but having a really good time. And uh, here's what the cores look like when they're first pulled out of the lake. These were a series of meter-long cores placed in um, near proximity and, and at the center of the lake, but also on the edge. And it was also a lot to connect them date-wise, too, later on. Um, and they're wrapped in... A, Oh, sleeping bags, you don't want them to freeze because that will distort things. So, and, and quickly shipped to this LaCour facility in Minnesota that's just phenomenal for um, large refrigeration to store uh, cores. And so you're seeing one opened up here and you're seeing really fine lamina, really just a quiet water body accreting over time, different layers, annual interannual and so on, and you're seeing some of the first sampling being done right here. Um, 
on the cores, just some of the background. So in terms of the proxy evidence that we used, um, so the, the evidence that is, uh, represents environment like uh, pollen and so on. I just want to uh, just mention the different types of data. So um, pollen and spores were, were maybe the main record to detail terrestrial environment through the length of the cores, through several thousand years. Um, my part in it involved all the plant macro remains, so um, wood, which is tiny, the arctic willow is knee-high, you know, there's shrub willows, there are little tiny birches and things, but birch isn't on the island. Um, and so this is, a, this is an ancient arctic willow. This is what the wood anatomy looks like on the microscope and also work with leaf epidermis, the cuticles for the breathing pores, and leaf skeletal tissue. And uh, for the most part, seeing a lot of uh, salix, the arctic willow. And this, these are modern representatives that I collected for comparison and moss is also. So that macros. For the aquatic environment, the lake itself, um, we examined diatoms, so they're um, planktonic algae, and can be very diagnostic and very um, sensitive to environmental changes, so they're a really good indicator of change in the lake, if, if there, we were going to see anything. And uh, cladocera, small, very minute crustaceans that similarly would be a, a stenotypic organism that would be greatly affected by any change, water fleas. We also use three other proxies. Sporomyella is a fungus, and we're looking for the fungi spores. And, and there's several texts, and not just Sporomyella itself, but they're obligate coprophages. They live on dung, live on, on decomposing dung material. So they're a good proxy for the presence of mastodons or mammoths, whatever, of megafauna in a, a watershed. And they've been used in other areas. So we were going to look for that as a record of the last stand of the mammoths. Of course, ancient DNA, looking, you know, as in, in sedimentary ancient DNA for a record of their presence and various geochemical analyses that would reflect any changes in in uh, climatic conditions and hydrology and so on that might affect the water. And so here's, here's uh, to sum up the results, some beginning, um, some of the first evidence. So the sedimentary DNA, here's the time scale for starters ranging from 12,000 to um, modern times here in this section of core. And the DNA, the green is positive for woolly mammoth and right up to about 55, 56,000 years ago, all the red indicates no signal. It's gone from the record. And because of recent mammoths being found in permafrost in Siberia um, and Alaska, it's been possible to sequence the genome of mammoth and then compare it directly of woolly mammoth. Here is uh, some of the bone dates. We recovered new bone dates from the mammoth teeth and, and other bone or bone from the island, and you're seeing um, dates plotted along here, and then there's just no more after this time frame. It's co coincident with the DNA. Here is the sporomyella, the spore, the fungi that lives on the dung, and it's very happy it, here, 9,000, 10,000 years ago, it starts to diminish, and it's gone you know, roughly the same point in time. You might notice this peak up here again. This is when the U.S. government introduced reindeer to the island. And so that's a completely separate thing. This is magnetic susceptibility. And basically, of the water column, it's speaking to the churning and turbidity of the water column. So you imagine elephants. So doing what elephants do, they're in the shallow waters, they're wallowing around, they're watering. Elephants have to have a lot of water. And so they're stirring things up, up until this point when it's just gone, right? So that, that's good. And you're seeing then too here, the island size plot and um, sea level. Sea level on this side, island size. It's kind of a pivotal period. So this 56 looks really important. We, we think that dates the extinction on St. Paul, and we just never did find 
anything more recent. And uh, here's some of the other data sets. So the diatoms range from planktonic, planktonic forms, more open, uh, free in the water column of the lake, to um, some changes in ones that are uh, conductivity tolerant, more of a maybe saline, somewhat saline. Um, brackish it was once described to me, but I don't know if it's that, that simple. So you're seeing a, a transition in diatoms, and likewise the cladocera. So this one too is um, increased relative to others, and this one too prefers this more uh, turbid waters. So um, what we think we're seeing here is that plotting also some of the isotopic signals, the lake was shrinking. There were issues with rainfall as climate was changing over the course of this time. The smaller water body and the elephants still present and churning things up were affecting water quality for, um, for these organisms and, and ultimately um, for the elephants themselves. Here's the magnetic record again. And here's the pollen record. The pollen in the plant macros, um, and you're seeing herbs and shrubs, was fairly consistent throughout. Some, some peaks here and there with, with uh, rainfall and cooler, drier conditions. But, um, so we don't think food was the problem, that forage was the problem. Um, the bottom line between all the different proxies is um, we think fresh water, and that was heralded in New York Times right after we published our article. So according to them, they may have been thirsty at their extinction. We think that they were on this smaller and smaller island trying to survive. Lake Hill was the main freshwater source on the island. There's no springs and uh, lakes, uh, streams and such as that, just Lake Hill and a few others, but um, very brackish. And they were losing that source of fresh water over time. So that's, that's been the main causal factor, we think, in this little island setting. And so that's sort of the Lake Hill story, the Privilov story. Uh, for Wrangell Island, it looks like population genetics. And there's been a lot of genetic work done on the mammoth material from that island. And it shows an increasingly small population and with incre increasing uh, adverse mutations. And so it's probably winked out for that reason. None of that really pertains to all those other grand extinction theories on the mainland, but you're getting a little glimpse of things in this isolate for these megafauna. All right, so um, now turning to Florida, to the panhandle region I mentioned at the beginning. In this case, you do have um, humans present and um, apparently interacting with megafauna, including the mastodons and others. We've got um, a fairly abundant evidence for tools like you see here. These long slender tools are called ivory foreshafts. Um, and they appear to have, well, they had to be made when the ivory was still green the, by the carving of the very intricate. Um, and there's butchered bone. There's evidence of butchering marks on mastodon bone. So they were interacting. Whether or not paleo-Indians wiped out mastodons and mammoths in Florida, that is still being looked at if they were really a factor. Um, so there's two sites in particular that I'm going to get into that for my work, focusing on the elephants and how they lived. Um, Paige Ladson and Latvis Simpson, and uh, you can see roughly their ages here. This is the confluence of the Wasissa and the Asilla River. And here's a tusk laying right on the, the bed, the waterbed. So um, in Florida, we had the Columbian mammoth, not the woolly mammoth, but the Columbian mammoth um, up until its extinction, and the American mastodon. And it's the mastodon that we have the most evidence for in that Asilla Wasissa River watershed. That's our, our forest elephant. And by all the pollen and other records, it was forested through this whole stretch of time. And there's some really interesting biogeographic implications about 
about the forest. They have strong links with the Appal Appalachians. All right, so, um, so as the paleoecology and the behavior of mastodons is understood, a lot of it is based on their common association with, um, with wetland settings throughout eastern North America. A lot of evidence from the northeast associating them with spruce bogs, and so it's thought to have been their main habitat, and that spruce itself was their main browse. Their a hind gut fermenter, a large elephant, needs to process a lot of woody browse, and so this was thought to have been a, a perfect place, and it's been described as a coniferous forest browsing niche. So for the greater Northeast, with much or nothing known about Florida mastodons. So um, these watersheds that I mentioned, the Oscilla and so on, happen to preserve, oh, I want to say tons, but a lot of mastodon poop. And that's what this is. We started calling it digesta originally, but it's mastodon dung, and, and there is lots and lots of it. And you can see that it's a very uniform particle length, woody brows, right? It fits those ridges and valleys in the mastodon teeth when you compare measurements. And we did some steroid analysis at UF, and it signals large elephant-like mammal. So all this dung, beautifully preserved, has been the focus of my work for some time. Here's African forest elephant dung by comparison with its uh, woody brows. These are dates from the dung samples. We've got more now, but just to give you a sense for Paige Ladson, all falling in that 12,000 to 12,5-ish window, so pretty consistent. Um, but with, with a combination of sites, we have them, you know, earlier, too, in the area. Okay, so here's a real busy diagram, um, and there's a point to all this. Um, what you're seeing is vegetation change, so not, not animals now, vegetation change through time across uh, eastern North America. So this is biomes beginning 7,000 and tracking through to modern, and then um, specific plant taxa, spruce, sedge, and birch, sort of a northerly suite as they retreat north. Here's uh, ash, the ash tree, hornbeam, hop hornbeam, and elms, and you're seeing movement following the colors. Not picking up much here. This is all based on pollen, and here's larch, fir, and pine. And again, from 17,000, and you're kind of seeing our modern pine forests in play here, and the larch and the fir as more northerly um, components. So, the whole point here is that you're seeing different plant taxa, different plant communities over time, and it's all mixed up, right? It's not just all the eastern deciduous forest moves north, and the southeastern forest is here. Lockstep movement doesn't work that way. Each taxon has differential ability to move across time and space and, and then attach its animal associates. And what you end up with are not only novel climates through these stretches of time, but no analog communities and ecological surprises, I love that. Unique combinations of plants and animals. So you can't just go out the door and describe the pine forest right there and, and use that as a perfect analog for any one of these points in the past. Do you see what I mean? They're unique, and if you're really gonna understand it, you need to, to look at it uniquely too. So um, communities that are, are cons Compositionally, unlike any today, no analog plant communities of the late glacial North America are tracked, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a newer line of research too, but I think very illuminating. And so, for example, with Florida, this is a pollen record from Camel Lake in Liberty County. There's some very close by in Goldhead State Park in Clay County. Um, some really good records. And you're seeing pine, oak, hickory, cypress, cypress cedar, spruce, what, spruce? Here's elm and others, right? 
sweet gum, you probably know that. And, and this is showing you its relative presence over time. Here's the depths uh, in this column. This is a 40,000 year record. All right, so you're seeing pine, you know, like dominant at this point in time, and oak is uh, not, it's diminished, but pine diminished here and oak, you see, so there's some interplay, yeah, variously. And we could talk all day about that. But my main point was the spruce. We don't see spruce growing today in Florida with elms and oaks and cypress and so on. It was present and fairly conspicuous, conspicuous about 12,000 years ago, and then it's just, it's gone. This one, too, is really of interest, Castania. Do you know what that genus is? That is chestnut, American chestnut. And the palynologist um, has attributed it, that pollen to that, to American chestnut, which was once, you know, a, a forest giant, see these humans, and a dominant throughout eastern North America, um, lost in, in recent uh, decades because of the chestnut blight. There's some records, some sporadic records for um, the far end of the panhandle today. Um, but otherwise, this is, has been eliminated. But, but there it is, variously through that whole Pleistocene record. So, so it's just a, a little sense of no analog situations. So chestnut, for the most part, retreated into the greater eastern woodlands along with a bunch of other things. And then and this, all that brings the question of how do plants move, They're not like animals to pick up and go. And, you know, many plants pollen, seeds, and so on have uh, wings and other adaptations for wind dispersal, and, and they've evolved for water dispersal. But there's a whole suite of plants that have evolved and co-evolved with, with animals as a dispersal mutualism. And um, if you see where I'm headed with this, um, the mastodon dung gives a chance to look at this ancient keystone species and how it may have had a role in, you know, um, some of the resilience and the perpetuation of the forest and maybe some movements of, of plants variously. So um, a little background by way of that is, as far as these adaptations, bird fruits are, are very specific, typically bright signaling, signaling colors to attract birds are often pulpy and sweet. Seeds survive consumption. Mammal fruits um, have high oil content, um, maybe very fleshy like avocado. Um, seeds might be toxic or bitter to discourage, you know, their being consumed as a final food, I guess I should say, or thick walled, because the whole point is to survive intact and be germinated if the animal is going to disperse and be this dispersal partner. Also, you're probably aware that another little adaptation on the part of plants is, is to hitch a ride. So various spines and hooks and things, um, everybody's familiar with this, is, is another uh, aspect on dispersal, dispersal mutualisms with vertebrates. Another thing is that uh, some years ago, uh, several researchers started to think about largish fruits, typically large, that seem to just fall to the ground. They don't have a disperser. And if you know Walter Judd, a botanist and, and ecologist at UF, he's responsible for some of this thinking. Um, and so finally someone went, well, wait a minute, maybe they lost their dispersal agent, as in Pleistocene megafauna. And Connie Barlow has written a whole book about this, which is really interesting. Um, you know, there's a whole aspect to the ecology that could be overlooked. So avocado itself is deemed to be one of these anachronistic fruits. Um, and was probably tied to ground sloths and mastodons as, as ancient dispersers. Tapers, the modern smaller tapers today, spit the pits out. They can't swallow the whole thing, but probably their ancient equivalents could. And there's some large-ish Pleistocene uh, fruits that hook onto animals like this form in Africa today as part of the riding along, thought to be part of this whole anachronistic assemblage. 
There's a whole series like um, Honey Locust and uh, Prickly Pear as two examples that, that dangle the fruit, the sweet pods in this case, and the sweet, you know, ripe fruits in this case, for these megafaunal dispersers that can reach them, ancient camels in Florida, but they're armed, armed and dangerous, so, uh, prickly and spines, thorns, so you don't want the whole plant being consumed and, and you're gone too. You just want that fruit dispersed. And gourds, you may be aware of m bitter melons, so wild Gourds. These are the ancestors of pumpkins and crookneck squash and such as we're so familiar with today. Um, they've been tied to an, a mutualism with ancient megafauna uh, as animals able to consume the seeds, avoiding the bitter rind and disperse the fruit. African elephants today will come up to bitter gourds in the Kalahari and just press them open with their foot, kind of pop it open and then consume the insides. So and another thing, and I'm just going to wing past this, is of course I looked at modern foraging behavior, modern elephants, to try to get some analog, some sense. Um, and this is just summarizing some of that. They may sample a wide range of plants as they move through the course of a day, um, tend to avoid too much in the way of toxic compounds, and they may consume bark from trees, stripping bark, provide some fatty acids and essential nutrients. Um, they tend to swallow fruits whole, so this relates to the mastodons, little seasonal variation. Um, may or may not agree absolutely with the densities of different plants in the local area. And um, they're fairly selective too as they move along. They're not eating everything. And uh, dung piles right in, in Africa. So maybe have as much as 40 seeds um, or more. Here's two, 291 per defecation event in this study. Um, here's 11 plant taxa, here's 13 taxa, here's 28 in this study, and uh, ranging across life forms. And I note too, um, in this case, bitter melon, that African equivalent was being consumed, and uh, the tree legume, thorny tree legume, kind of like that locust I just showed. And, uh, and then how much dung can an elephant make? There are studies on that too. So, you know, 14 piles per elephant per day um, for 25,000 elephants in this one preserve. It's a few tons, you know, lots of dung. So now you can start to envision, and literally there are layers of this dung deposit in the Asilla River. And the peat deposits bracketing below and above are quite different, just nothing, they're normal. <laughs> All right, so back to the Alcilla River dung. So here's the image you saw before, and then some close-up of, the, uh, of the chopped up woody vegetation. It's generally the terminal twigs, and it's virtually all of it bald cypress. So the terminal members of bald cypress, there wasn't much in the way of spruce, right? But lots of cypress and Florida wetlands, and they were processing lots of cypress. And these, you know, are often sort of clipped off at the end, as you can imagine. Again, that molar mill crunching things along. And uh, cypress cones and the cone segments are also present in the dung, and next to no leaf material, only very rare occasional leaves. That had me scratching my head for a while, and then I thought, well, it's a deciduous conifer, so maybe that tells us something about when the mastodons were present in the Asilla River drainage and, and thereby environs, you know, that just not living there full time, maybe they were migratory. And so um, working with one of our isotopes experts who um, sampled the growth increments of the tusks, and you can tell all kinds of things about seasonal movements and, and related matters, it, it turns out that they were actually tracking on an annual basis from, from the Panhandle region of Florida here up into the uh, lower Piedmont, back and forth, back and forth. That was their, at least this assemblage of mastodons living in that 
that general area. So that's kind of interesting. And now think about trees is moving back and forth too over time. So mastodon trail mix, mastodon food. In addition to that bulk, the main cypress browse, they were consuming hazelnuts and American beech and also acorns and hickory nuts. And the hazelnut is especially interesting um, because it's no longer present in Florida. Here is, um, here is some of the actual nuts. You can see that they're beautifully preserved and quite a few of them are lopped off, I think, again, against the molar mill as these animals are just gulping things down. Here is, uh, here's the modern range for hazelnut. So imagine these animals moving back and forth and kind of assisting the movement of this plant as, um, you know, presumably once present more widely in Florida, but with the retreat of the glacial conditions then moving further north. And in fact, um, these are other records for hazelnut in Florida all the way down to um, the Cutler Ridge site in the late Pleistocene. Um, Tampa Bay is a really very early one, and here's the Asilla River. So you kind of get the impression, and this is the wider Florida platform for this being a, a forest component until it's retreated, and maybe elephants helped in, in the spread. They also were into fleshy fruits, so mastodons ate uh, wild plums and hawthorns and wild grapes, blackberries, pokeweed, which would be a good wormer as well, possibly crabapple and persimmon, um, not as well preserved. And this is one of the plum pits. You can see how it's kind of scoured looking, maybe from some uh, residence time in the gut. Some thorns, too. Some of these plants are armed, um, like the, the blackberries, uh, the curtigus, hawthorn. Uh, also some water locust and honey locust present in the sample. So the thorn defense wasn't always uh, perfect against consumption of the whole plant. And the things that ride along in the fur. So there's um, quite a number of cockle burrs. This is modern and here's from the mastodon dung present. And you know, you can imagine it, it just being stuck to their, their hair, their hides and grooming and they end up consuming it if, if they weren't just consuming the plants. This is my favorite component of the mastodon dung. So do you know, uh, does anybody know what that genus is? It's cucurbita, and it is wild gourd, right? So um, we have ridiculous numbers of gourd seeds in the mastodon dung, and not later and not earlier. Um, in addition to the abundant seeds, there's a, a, a few fragments of, of vine, not much, and there's no rind. Maybe one piece, I actually want to think about it, but versus thousands of seeds. So these were abundantly present in that ecosystem. Do you see wild gourds in Florida today? There's one little population on the St. Johns River, and there's Okeechobeeensis around the Okeechobee Basin, but they're all over ancient Florida. Um, and that's where I'm headed next. So these wild gourds, right? Um, I mentioned about Kalahari melons, so, so uh, mice in the Kalahari will consume the seeds and the contents, people and elephants in the Kalahari, same thing, but not the bitter rind. The cucurbitacin is one of the most bitter plant defenses against herbivory, plant compounds known. You can't just eat it directly. Um, and over time, humans uh, domesticated forms that were non-bitter, so the pumpkins, you know, that we eat today, but, but the ancient forms are bitter. So um, one thing that my students and I started wondering about was mastodons, what would the effect of consuming so much bitter gourd, assuming they weren't always successful in avoiding the rind, do? So we, we did a genetic study across uh, 40 mammal clades to 45 genomes to look for bitter taste receptors and maybe just get a little bit of a fix on that. 
And we found the highest were in shrews and other small species, um, had the most taste receptors, so they're able to avoid these very noxious compounds that might just completely do them in. And fewest in manatee, an elephant relative, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of predictable though, when I mean, you don't have gourds underwater. But generally what we also concluded too is that the uh, elephants can take, you know, intake some of this material and because there's this kind of fast residence time through their system, they have to eat a whole lot before it becomes lethal for them. So it probably didn't hurt the mastodons. So that was just kind of a fun sidetrack. But the other thing we were doing in this genetic work is we assumed that, we hypothesized that when the mastodons went extinct, then these gourds should experience a genetic bottleneck and maybe wink out too um, at the time that the all this was uh, happening, the mastodons were disappearing. And we, we do actually see a genetic bottleneck uh, analyzing ancient DNA and modern gourd representatives. Um, but ultimately we think that humans ended up sort of filling that niche. Humans were starting to recognize these little hard shelled fruits and saving them and making use of them. And um, we think that humans, that this was something else that the New York Times picked up, um, made the difference. That's why they survived into modern times. Lost their elephant disperser, but humans assumed that role. And this is what I was alluding to a minute ago. The archaeological cucurbita is all over the state. Almost every site I look at, some of these are cemeteries, and some of this is a sister genus bottle gourd, which is really interesting. Um, and so it's, it's everywhere. We just don't see wild gourds all over the state, but they were in the past, so we're in archaeological time here. And, uh, and there's abundant evidence for seed changes, like you see here. This is Hontoon Island on the St. Johns River um, under domestication. This would be like a scallop squash, and here's the ancient bitter form. These are pumpkin types later in time. Um, so in other words, humans were probably managing these plants and cultivating them and ultimately domesticating them. There's absolute no doubt that your pumpkins and crookneck are uh, all about eastern Indians. They, it was all domesticated here in, uh, in, in eastern North America. And we find the gourds in fishnet, ancient fishnet remains. Um, and if you come to my lab in Flagler, I'll show you fishnet that we just excavated. It's made from palm fiber and it has the gourds. And also some of the gourds were used as containers. We see that and ultimately domesticated into edible forms. So that, that took us into people and away from the elephants. And I don't have an answer for the Florida mastodons as to the role of humans and why they became extinct, but I really love this work for a chance to just look at an ice age, you know, animal and the associated environment and think about them as a keystone species and change. That's where we're headed now with this. So, so that was my last slide. And, uh, yeah, so not, it's not a carrot, it's gourds. And, uh, and I thank you all, and I'd be glad to answer any questions if I can, if you, if you have some. Mm -hmm. <laughs>